Hello everybody, I'm Rene Ramos, director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives, and this is Rewind, the show that looks back on Florida's past with historic film and video. It's time for another trip back into the past, so sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Rewind. At sunup every morning, the migration begins. America's forts fishermen take to the water. They number over 30 million strong, generators of a multi-billion dollar industry. The lure? It's partly the challenge, partly the universal need to escape the pressures of everyday routine, to seek peace in nature. But for the past 80 years in the lakes and streams of the southeastern United States, a silent aggressor has stalked the pleasures and profits of sports fishing. The villain, a delicate flowering beauty, out of control, water hyacinth. The most popular theory about the origins of Iconia crassipes, or water hyacinth, is that the plant is native to South America. It is found in abundance in the backwaters of the Amazon basin and the Pernambuco region of Brazil and in the lower Orinoco in Venezuela. The plant is also found, though not in such profusion, in other areas of South America. It seems to have evolved there in a balanced environment where natural enemies and flood tides have prevented it from becoming a serious problem. The hyacinth was first described in print in 1823 in a scientific paper from Brazil. At that time, the plant appeared to be confined to that part of the world. But like the starling and the Norway rat, the hyacinth soon spread rapidly with the help of man. Enticed by the plant's delicate beauty, people throughout the world sought it out and introduced it into their own countries. By the early 1900s, the plants began appearing in the United States, in the waterways of Louisiana. The earliest official record indicates that they were brought into the country for the New Orleans Cotton Exposition of 1884 and given away as souvenirs. Just how they got into the waterways, nobody knows. But within a few short years, they were thoroughly entrenched, creating a serious navigational hazard in the complex Mississippi tributaries that wind through the south central part of the state. Since commercial fishing is a major industry in Louisiana, and economic crops such as sugarcane, rice, and lumber depend heavily on water transportation, the waterways must be kept open at any cost. Because of this infestation of water hyacinths, that cost has ranged as high as $15 million a year. But Louisiana was only the beginning. Soon the entire South began to feel the impact of the transplanted newcomer. From Louisiana, the infestation spread to Mississippi and Texas, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina. Water hyacinths were even discovered in the waterways of Southern California. By the turn of the century, the delicate ornamental flower had become a problem of national concern. According to Bill Rushing of the Army Corps of Engineers, it still is. 
The Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for keeping open the navigable waterways of this nation. One of the most serious problems that we face is managing aquatic plants through our aquatic plant control program. The most serious single aquatic plant problem is associated with the massive infestation of water hyacinths. Although water hyacinths exist throughout the southern states, the most serious and costly problems exist in the states of Louisiana and Florida. In the state of Florida, the Army Corps of Engineers have their work cut out for them. According to a recent survey of the state's 2,500,000 acres of fresh water, 80% have a potential water hyacinth problem. This problem is compounded by a biological characteristic of the plant. Water hyacinths are highly prolific. One research paper reports that just 10 of these plants can produce 655,000 new plants in one eight-month growing period. Ted Center, a researcher at the University of Florida, puts it another way. A good many figures are quoted for the growth rates of water hyacinths. Uh, one of the most reliable that I know of is that they grow, they gain weight at the rate of about one and a half percent per day. This is, doesn't sound like a very impressive figure, but if you extend this uh, or compound this figure for over a year, that means that a single plant will increase 200-fold. A good part of the problem with water hyacinths is their ability to colonize a given body of water. When the plants are small and the population isn't too crowded, they produce these very bulbous, petioles which function as floats. Most of their growth occurs laterally over the surface of the water and they rapidly fill up the available space. Offshoots are produced on long stolons. As the mat, the water hyacinth mat becomes more crowded however and the available space is used up, the petioles become very long and the plants much larger. This is because they're forced to compete with li for light and they must display their leaves. So they try to extend them above the neighboring plants. The lush growth of water hyacinth in Florida, particularly South Florida, stems in part from the plant's natural reproductive ability and from the fact that it grows year round in a tropical climate. But there are two other factors that make the yield potential of hyacinths even greater in Florida than in South America. First, transplanting the hyacinths has removed them from their natural enemies, that is, the insects and the pathogens that help to keep them in check biologically in their native environment. Though it is true that some North American insects have moved from other plants to feed on water hyacinths growing here, their numbers are few, and their impact on the spread of the plants has been minimal. The second factor is the water in which the plants grow. The fertilizers and the soil additives used to grow more productive crops on land have washed into these already nutrient-rich waters, making them even richer. Add to this water, as we have, the outflow of sewage treatment plants and you increase the nutrients even more. The result, ideal growing conditions for the hyacinth. Unchecked, a fringe of water hyacinth grows wider at the rate of two feet per month. Without controls, the plant will cover the water surface, destroying the area as a usable fish habitat. It does this by destroying the aquatic food chain from the bottom up. The dense plant covering prevents sunlight from penetrating the surface. Without sunlight, phytoplankton, the minute oxygen-producing food plant that is the base of the aquatic food chain, cannot exist. With its disappearance, the entire food chain is disrupted. Because the plants transpire water at more than twice the normal evaporation rate of an open surface, water hyacinths also lower the water level. 
This makes them dangerous intruders in shallow spawning areas where the water level is a crucial factor. Fish camp operators equate the water hyacinth problem in terms of dollars and cents. Waters fouled with the flowering weed discourage fishing, and to them, that means a loss of revenue. For the fishermen, the plants remain a recurring nuisance. Do they seem to be any better this year than they were last year? A little bit better, but not very much. But, uh, there's still too many hyacinths. Fishermen are not the only ones concerned with the hyacinth problem. The state and private citrus growers spend millions of dollars every year to keep the canals that service Florida's 900,000 acres of citrus groves free of the plants. The concern spills over into many other areas of agriculture where the flow of fresh water is necessary. Left unchecked, the plants would pack these canals from bank to bank, cutting off the vital water lifeline. The stagnant canals could then become breeding areas for mosquitoes and disease. The question is not, do we need to control the growth of water hyacinths, but what method is best? Over the years, man has applied his ingenuity and mechanical aptitude in his efforts to hold back the hyacinth. has been partially successful. Although the machines have not eradicated or prevented the spread of the troublesome weed, they have enabled the authorities to keep the waterways open at a considerable price. It's been estimated that the mechanical control of aquatic weeds costs between $500 and $1,500 an acre. At the turn of the century, a more effective and less expensive means of control was instituted. The use of chemicals, particularly sodium arsenate. With sodium arsenate, control personnel could obtain a complete kill and sinking of the plants within 21 days. Unfortunately, the chemical also killed cows. So in 1936, after an alarming number of cattle deaths, the Florida legislature banned the use of any chemical process injurious to cattle. A year later, Louisiana followed suit, and mechanical control methods once again became the mainstay of the hyacinth control program in the United States. The next breakthrough came in 1945, in the form of a new chemical 2,4-D. 2,4-D is relatively non-toxic. It is effective in killing aquatic weeds, including water hyacinths, and when compared to mechanical control costs, it is relatively inexpensive. The chemical was soon put into wide use and today continues to be the most popular and effective means of hyacinth control. However, there are people in the control program, like Dr. Al Burkhalder of the Florida Department of Natural Resources, who feel that 2,4-D is not the ultimate answer. Although chemicals are currently our major method of control, their use is becoming more and more prohibitive, not only from some of the environmental aspects, but also from the economic aspects. Our herbicidal products are petroleum-based type products. And because of this, they will fluctuate as our energy market fluctuates. 
Several years ago, before the gasoline crisis or the petroleum crisis, we estimated that our annual cost in controlling an acre of water hyacinth was between 10 and $15 per acre. However, since the petroleum crisis, these costs have spiraled. Today, we annually spend $25 to $35 per acre to control water hyacinth, and we expect these costs to increase as time goes on. We have found ourselves in a position where we need to hasten our research and to get into other areas of control because our chemical programs are now becoming somewhat limited due to this economic crunch and we must find cheaper methods of control. The call for a less expensive, supplementary means of controlling water hyacinth is echoed around the world and in many areas with desperation. On a worldwide scope, the hyacinth problem is compounded by the geographic pattern of its spread. It reaches around the world in a band between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, an area that includes the greatest concentration of the third world nations and the smallest concentration of the world's wealth. In these countries, a rampant hyacinth problem could become critical, jeopardizing already insufficient food crops. Ironically, here where control is most needed, the money to maintain an effective control program is most difficult to find. The one hope for most of these countries is the development of an economically feasible, environmentally safe control system a system that incorporates biological control. Biological control for aquatic weeds is not an unproven theory. There is a precedent, a successful system developed a few years ago for another transplanted aquatic pest, the alligator weed. When man transplanted alligator weed or water hyacinth, he removed them from their natural enemies, from nature's controls. The object of biological control is to reintroduce some of these natural enemies to keep the plant in check in its new environment. Eight and a half years of extensive research and study, both in South America and here, produced a biological system that effectively controls alligator weed. The system involves three organisms intimately involved with alligator weed in its native environment. Agasicles hygrophilia, Voctia meloi, and Amenothrips andersonii, with this success firmly established in 1968, the researchers switched their attention to water hyacinths. Once again, they returned to South America to a research substation that had been set up in Argentina by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, with financial support from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Argentina was selected because the climate there parallels that found in the southern United States. Again, the tedious job of searching out and collecting insects was begun. In this delicately balanced aquatic environment, there are many possible candidates. The researcher's challenge is to isolate from this vast possibility those few insects that would be effective control agents without creating additional environmental problems. The key is specificity. The search is for those insects that feed specifically, exclusively on water hyacinth. Each day's collection of specimens is brought back to the laboratory for identification and extensive testing. The first series of tests are to find out if the insect under consideration will feed on plants other than the hyacinth. Economically, 
valuable plants such as rice or sugarcane are of particular interest. The insects are placed on the plant and encased, isolated from any other food source. It becomes a matter of feeding on the host plant or perishing. For the insect to be considered further, it must choose death. In another series of tests, the insects are given a choice between hyacinths and other plants. These tests are to see if the insect can be tempted away from the water hyacinths by the availability of another possible food source. The third series of tests involves plants closely related to water hyacinths. Two identical trays are prepared, one to be used as control. Both water hyacinths and related plants are placed in the trays and the insects being tested are released and allowed to sustain themselves on the hyacinth for a period of time. After the insects are acclimated to their test environment, the water hyacinths in the test tray are sprayed with a herbicide. The object of the test is to see if the insects will feed on the other plants when they can no longer feed on the hyacinths. Reports on each experiment are forwarded to an interagency working group on biological control located in Washington, D.C., who evaluate test results. When a promising candidate for biological control is isolated, permission is requested from the Department of Agriculture to bring the species into quarantine in the United States for further testing. Since the research began in 1968, many potential control agents have been isolated and tested in South America. A number of them, like this tiny grasshopper, Cornaps aquaticum, are still under study there. But only three insects to date have come through the rigorous testing with the results sufficiently positive to warrant their import into the United States for further testing. One of them is Samiotes, a petty old boring insect which has proven highly specific to water hyacinths in testing. This insect lays its eggs in the plant tissue. The newly hatched larvae burrow beneath the epidermis and ultimately create large burrows in the petioles. The other two successful candidates are two closely related weevils, Neocatina brucai and this insect, Neocatina iconii. The life history of both weevils is closely linked to water hyacinth. They lay their eggs directly in the plant tissue. The larvae emerge and tunnel down the petiole and into the rhizome. The larva pupates in the roots and according to testing, must have hyacinth roots to pupate successfully. The adults feed on the outer surface of the leaves and petioles leaving distinctive round feeding spots. When the specificity of Neocatina iconii was clearly established for the test lab in Argentina, permission was sought and granted to bring the insect into quarantine in the United States. Specimens were carefully gathered and checked to make sure they were free of pathogens and parasites. The weevils were then divided according to sex and packed and shipped to the United States. When the specimens arrived, they were checked again. Exotic insects are usually kept in quarantine from six months to a year. In the case of Neocatina iconii, the time was spent repeating some of the South American tests and checking the weevils on plants not found there, but common to its proposed new environment. Rigid government regulations demand that as soon as the specimen shows any sign of being a potential hazard to the environment, it must be destroyed. But Neocatina iconii came through all testing with flying colors, and permission for the release of the weevil was granted by state and federal agricultural agencies in 1972. 
and it was released in several test sites in the state of Florida. The potential of Neocatina icornii as a biological control element has been demonstrated at this site on the campus of the University of Florida. But as the researchers who developed the successful control system for alligator weed learned, biological control requires more than a single agent and research continues in Argentina and in the United States. Scientists are not only working with exotic insects, native insects such as the Otzama dunza are being studied to see if they will adapt to water hyacinths. Pathogens are also under consideration. The pathology department of the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences of the University of Florida has begun an active program into a search for pathogens that could be used for water hyacinth control. Together with insects and pathogens and other biotic agents perhaps, such as mites, we hope that we will see a reduction in this unabated growth that is often found associated with water hyacinth. Biological control may solve more than the financial problems involved in hyacinth control. One attribute of biological control is once it is put into effect, it becomes self-perpetuating in most in instances. And we hope that this is going to be what we will see happen in using insects, pathogens, and other biotic agents for the biological control of water hyacinths. Unchecked, the water hyacinth becomes an insidious, destructive menace. Current methods of control, though relatively effective, are not always environmentally desirable, and they are becoming more and more costly. For underdeveloped countries, almost prohibitive. Yet there may be an answer in nature itself, in the laboratory and in the field. Research goes on for the right combination of biotic agents, the combination that will keep water hyacinths in check and make them a compatible part of their aquatic environment. Biological control, applied ecology. Tomorrow's answer being developed today. That's about it for this edition of Rewind. Just time to remind you that Rewind features historical film and video from the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. To see more from the Wolfson Archives collections, visit our website, wolfsonarchives.org. You can search the archives catalog and watch video online. And be sure to connect to our YouTube channel where you will find hundreds of carefully curated clips or link to the Wolfson Archives Facebook page to keep up with our busy calendar of historical happenings. Until next time, I'm Rene Ramos. Thanks for watching. Oh, wow.